Welcome to the show, and thank you for taking the time to check us out. I've been churning out these episodes left and right, and I hope you all are enjoying listening to them as much as I'm enjoying making them. And I hope you'll continue to follow the show as we grow and branch out and do more and more of a variety of guests. I'm really excited about some of the people I have scheduled. Uh, A lot of musicians, yes, but also some authors and someone I can't say what he does or it'll give it away, but he was recently on a very popular Netflix show. Uh, I'm also talking to a variety of other people. Should be a lot of fun. Um, Not only is the show growing and branching out with the guests, uh, but also the conversations itself. I really am trying to talk about more different kinds of topics with the guests. Like when I had uh, Keith Wallen from Breaking Benjamin on, we got into a conversation about movies. Uh, I had Clay Dieters from The Issue, and we ended up talking about hockey. It's just fun sometimes to follow the rabbit holes and kind of see what goes on in people's heads and what they're interested in. And so do you like that or do you prefer just straight music talk all the time? Uh, Let me know. But I think it's fun to talk about all sorts of stuff, which brings me to my guest today, uh, Steve Lips Kudlow of Anvil. And uh, he's quite a character. And I definitely talked to him about all sorts of shit, including his opinions on the legalization of weed because of that's kind of the theme of their album. Uh, Guns in America, Ted Nugent's politics. It's all fascinating stuff. Um, He's an interesting guy, very passionate about things. He definitely gets riled up a lot in this interview and says fuck a lot. So if you're easily offended by cursing or politics or drugs, this is not the episode for you. But I fucking loved it personally. I think he's an interesting guy. Not necessarily that I adopt all the same views as him, but if you're not familiar with Lips or the band Anvil, definitely check out the documentary. You can see it on Amazon Prime for $4 and it's worth it. Uh, Anvil was a very influential band on Motorhead, Metallica, Anthrax, Slayer, so many other bands. And thankfully, after that movie come, came out, they finally got the credit for a lot of that. So I'll let Lips tell you more of the stories with this interview. Here we go. Uh, welcome, Steve uh, Lips Kudlow to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so you're in Canada, right? Yes. That's where I am. That's where you're from, and that's where you live now. So tell me, the diff- in your mind, what are the biggest differences between Canada and the U.S.? Dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do you begin? Like, the, 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 it's, the reason that it's silent is because I don't even know where to begin. We're so too many, too many to name. But is there things yeah, that you notice, like when yeah, you go on? Like, you want to talk about it politically? Where Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just uh, like maybe we don't want to go political. That's for sure. Well, we can get <laughs> to political <laughs> later. <laughs> but let's just—I just wonder, like, when you tour the U.S., is there things that like annoy you, or you're excited? Like, certain—is there maybe certain rules or restaurants or things or landmarks in the U.S. that you're like, oh. I love this part about the U.S. Or are there, are there things that you dread about the U.S.? Um, traffic. Okay. You know, traffic in Washington D.C. or Chicago or New York or Los Angeles. Fucking horrible traffic. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely definitely true. I, I'm from I mean, any, anybody anybody who's been to those places and knows. You hit three o'clock in the afternoon, you're going nowhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And like, in, yeah, New York, you really, I mean, everybody takes the subway. Nobody even drives there. Yeah, well, true enough. Um, I actually got less complaints about New York than I do about Los Angeles in, in regard to, uh, like, even in the last couple of times, like going, going, into the, going into the city, like going through the, the tunnel or, or whatever, it hasn't been too bad in the, in the last, but Los Angeles, forget it, man. Yeah, no, Fuck. I mean, or San Francisco. Have you ever oh, tried to drive oh, it? Man, forget it. it. It's just hours to go anywhere. Yeah. 10 minutes down the foot, 10 minutes normally. Right. You're two hours to get there. For Fuck sure. It. Stupid shit. <laughs> <laughs> so are you kind of more in the, in like a little smaller area in Canada right now? Like it's just not as crowded, not as congested. Oh, well, I'm in Toronto, which is probably the most populated place in Canada. But like, are you in like a suburb of that? Or are you like in the, like the heart of it? 
No, I'm in the middle, right in the middle of the city. And it's not the traffic um, isn't bad there. No, it's not. It's we haven't got the population. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's where you grew up and that's where you, uh, you know, I always think of these things are so funny. Cause like your drummer, Rob, I mean, he was, you know, your friend and your bandmate and your neighbor. What if you guys lived in different cities and you never met him? I mean, it's such amazing coincidence that you two happen to live near each other and you're both well, amazing. It's an amazing coincidence that John Lennon and Paul McCartney lived in the same <laughs> town too. Right? I guess it's so. Not a matter yeah. of coincidence. It's, it's the way the, it's the way the chips fell. Yeah, because he's really an. Has he always been at even age fourteen? Were you like, holy shit? Because that guy drums. I mean, he's just like, it's so fast and crazy. I mean, even still to this day, I'm still amazed. I I don't think there's many drummers that could keep up with him. No, probably not. It's the, uh, it's you know it's I I don't know any different. <laughs> <laughs> playing with Rob since uh, since I began playing, so I, I don't know any different. That's right. So you never had another band or or flirted with other projects or anything. No. Yeah. So you guys are you guys start this band at a young age, and then is it Johnny Z? Is that the first guy that kind of like brought you to the states to play? And and he's responsible for Metallica and Anthrax and all those guys, right? Yeah, that was the first show we ever did in the states for Johnny Z. And, but it, what happened was uh, that one of the problems for you guys was you guys got stuck in the mud with this bad manager, right? Isn't that what happened? Uh, not well. It's it's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff at play. Yeah, we 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 raised a huge amount of interest and 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 um, things were going very well in Europe and. Uh, the, the spinoff, what, what eventually happened, Johnny Z was running a music a, a record store in, in, a, in a flea market in New Jersey, and he was importing Kerrang! magazines and sound magazines. And he started learning about this band Anvil up in Canada. He didn't learn it from us from Canada. He learned from us about us from the UK. Okay, interesting. Well, because there's... In 1981, right. there was no metal scene or <laughs> fanzines or fuck all in North America. So where are you going to find out the information from England, where heavy metal was 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 making its big its big start? Right. So so what he did is we were the closest metal band in the world, close to him. Mm -hmm. So he contacted our record label. And hired us to come down to a, a play in a flea market. Was that a big show? Flea market, in New Jersey. How many people <laughs> showed up for that? About twelve hundred. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, it was amazing because it, he knew that we already he was selling tons of metal on metal and hard and heavy albums out of his out of his uh, out of his store. So all the, he knew that all he had to do was put up a put up a, a sign that said Anvil was coming in a couple of weeks and everybody that was coming to the store, the word spread like, like wildfire. So it was no problem in, in, in actually putting on a show. And that was a big, big, huge thing for Johnny because he had, he, it was the first time he'd actually ventured out as trying to be a promoter or trying to be, I don't know, involved in the music business. We go out and play and it's a huge success for him. And that moment in his life, he, it, it sparked him. I'm going to, I'm going for this. I'm going to, I'm going to fucking do it. And what, what actually did happen, um, of course, all of this at the same time, uh, we put out metal on metal. And of course things were really, really started to rock in, 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 in Europe. And, um, what, what eventually happened was, of course, now the American American constituents were thinking about having us come down. So we got involved all of a sudden because of our, our the excitement that we were caused in Europe. All of a sudden, we had interest from one of the biggest managers in the United States. I'm talking about David Krebs, who's who's managed uh, Ted Nugent, Aerosmith, Scorpions, fucking. Joe yeah. Jett. I, I can go on. It's it's a it's a ridiculous list. 
But anyway, he was just, um, it was just a, maybe not a good fit for you guys because he was more, uh, had managed more of the, not as heavy of bands, right? But it, there was no such thing as heavy. Yeah. <laughs> all, there, all there was was rock music. He, right. And he, he like, he's, he goes, oh, well, you know, I got to see this band. So he hires us in the midst of us recording our third album. We were literally in the middle of bed tracks. And we get a call. We got five shows with Aerosmith in the northeast of in the northeast of, of north america so we did montreal we did we did uh syracuse we did philadelphia we did uh, you know a bunch of shows with aerosmith so that he could come see us play yeah and so how was that was this when the this was when they were boozing right we, we is... had no release how was it we're playing <laughs> play the philadelphia spectrum you know we're playing this big fucking huge place Steven Tyler had been in a motorcycle accident and ripped his uh, heel off of his fucking foot. So he's on fucking medication and they couldn't get him out of fucking bed. Oh shit. So here we are at the Philadelphia spectrum and the, the, um, the uh, uh, tour manager, the Rob, uh, Aerosmith tour manager comes into our change room. He goes, listen guys, he says, I want you up on stage right now. And you've got to do an hour and a half. Stephen, we can't get Stephen out of bed, right? So there we are playing for an hour and a half in front of an audience that never even heard our music before. <laughs> so how the fuck did it go? It, yeah. Kind of etchy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, and you guys are... So we weren't getting booed, but people are going... What the fuck is this? An hour and a half of a band I never heard of. It's I'm like, picturing like okay. Back to the Future, where uh, Marty McFly is playing the the heavy like the heavy guitar solo in the '50s, like because you guys were so much heavier than Aerosmith. I'm sure the Aerosmith fans were not used to that. Yeah, well, they, they accepted it because there was an, uh, totally totally accepted it because there was an there's an aspect of of, of Anvil that's that has a similarity to Ted Nugent. Sure. So, yeah. It was actually a good fit. See, the thing is, it's a misconception. Anvil, Anvil is is a band that fell in the crack. Heavy metal. Mm -hmm. We started out in in the late seventies, and our first album was basically a hard rock album. It was not a heavy metal album. Heavy metal hadn't it hadn't even been called a heavy metal yet. Right. It, it was. The, 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 at least during the, the the inception and the and the writing of that music, there what they didn't call it heavy metal. It didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really until after eighty one that it. What is this? It's heavy metal, right? That's what they started calling it. Yeah. So, so what happened was when we when we went to we the record label signed us on our first album, but we were called Lips. And the guy's going, well, how are we going to market this? This thing called heavy metal is happening. You guys better think of a name that's going to be conducive with that with that genre. So, of course, we made up a fucking list, which almost every fucking name on that list has been used. Really? <laughs> yeah, because every everybody's taken those names. It was at a time before metal even existed. Yeah. So everything everything got used after that fact. So we had the whole fucking choice. And what could be a better heavy metal name than Anvil? One of the heaviest things. Absolutely. It's like, fuck, one and one is two. This is a fucking, that's great. Okay, so, you know, we took that into the record label. Of course, they were ec ecstatic about that. They thought this is fantastic because anything that's an inanimate object, this will, you could make easily make logos out of it. Right. It's really identifiable. It's really marketable. They're fucking awesome. No, I love of it. Of course, it, it it did it did its fucking trick. It it sparked up the UK where heavy metal was was the thing at that moment, and we started, and that really started our career off. Right, and so and I one of the things. Unfortunately, we got involved. Like I said, that that got David Krebs involved, and of course, we're out opening for Aerosmith, and we play six six six, and we finish, and and you know the people are just standing there going, "What the fuck's that?" Right. We're playing speed metal. No one even fucking ever heard this shit before, right? <laughs> anyway, the 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 um you know the label the labels the guy the, the guy that got actually did sign Metallica was in my in the change room. At, at, we did a show with a band called Zebra, which is really a hard rock band. It was mm -hmm. a three piece 
hard rock band. I think the keyboards, if, if I'm not mistaken. It's so long ago. Fuck, man, we're talking 40 <laughs> years. Anyways, uh, we do the show with them, and the, the labels come upstairs, and the guy goes, this is great, but I don't know how we're going to market it. You know, you heard Forge and Fire, the Forge and Fire album. You know how to fucking, how are we going to market this? We don't even know what the fuck it is. You know, um, David Krebs listens to us play, playing and we're playing this speed metal. He goes, listen, guys, you got to drop that stuff out of your set. What? I'm fucking dead serious. Yeah. He's saying, you got to, you know, we're playing 666 and Jackhammer. He's going, you got to get rid of that stuff in the set. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, that's what everybody's coming to see. Right. That's the new cutting edge stuff for sure. That was it. Yeah. It, it, it. It's like, you're telling me to stop the stuff that's given us the, our fucking, our fucking name. Yeah. Like what the fuck? Wrong manager. Right. That's what it was. It wasn't, oh, he was a bad manager. Oh, it was just the wrong that manager. Wrong manager is yeah. approaching all the wrong people at, at all the labels. So the labels are going, yeah, we'll take the band, but we want the first three albums for free. Hmm. We're not paying any advance against it. Now, what fucking label in their right mind, like who's paid the money for their recordings of their of the band that they've fucking supporting, who's gonna what label's gonna give it away for free? Yeah. It ain't gonna happen. Right. And that's where the ball, that's where the ball fell. Right there. That's it. It's over. We got it. We got it. We got that rise, and we're on the cusp. We're going to break through. We're going to get that major label, and then it's going to fucking start happening. Well, the major labels don't want it unless they can have everything for free. Gotcha. Well, how the fuck does that work? It doesn't. Yeah. So that's kind of where that's part of the one of the things that went wrong. So there we were in 1983, and uh, David got us out of the record deal in Canada, and now we had no record deal. For four fucking years. Oh, I didn't even know that. There was four years with no label? No label, no releases. Oh, the shit. four most important years in heavy metal history, and Anvil gets pulled out of the stream. Oh. And people are going, it's because they suck. Fuck you. No, Fuck that's, you. That's, that's awful. what I gotta say. Right. Fuck you all. No, because. Steal, my, steal all my ideas, make everybody else big, but Anvil sucked. Fuck you. That's what, ha so that's what happened. That explains a lot. So, cause you guys were such an influence so much so that in 81, uh, didn't let me, let me ask you to join motorhead. I didn't know that, that until I did my research and you turned him down. That's pretty cool that yeah, you, because I, was in the, because I, I was in the middle. I'm an anvil. Yeah. Is that, so is I'm that, an anvil. I'm the singer of anvil. Why am I joining motorhead? Right. It, that, that makes no fucking sense. And he even admitted it made no sense, but he loved the band and loved what we were doing. And, and he, he liked me. He liked me as a human being. He wanted to be with, work with me. Okay. But the, the, that's not what, it, it, when you're under contracts and you, you got, gee, I would have loved to have done it, but I can't be in two places at once. Right. And you can't, you can't leave a contract when they're paying for your fucking it was a record deal. It wasn't an, a licensing deal. So they, they own, they own me in a certain sense. I, if I, if I go join Motorhead, they've got dibbies on that, on whatever I do in that band. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm signed to them personally. Right. No, and that... individual. That's it. So it's not possible on, on any level. It was not possible. But the, the 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 mutual respect between Lemmy and I was was was, was great. I mean, Lemmy was, you know, it's a, that's a, you're talking about somebody that was like an older brother to me. It's uh, I miss him terribly, and it's it's uh, it's like you know, it's like missing a, a limb. It, it, it's never the same, man. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And I mean, but you did get back on the horse and you made uh, more albums and you made, I think, uh, through the eighties and nineties, you had 12 oh, albums. Been, listen, man, I, I realized, I realized very, 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 very early on. And if I, if, if not, I knew all along, this is not about, you can have the dreams of making millions of dollars, but one in a million does that. So to me, it was like, I'm going to do this for a lifetime. 
It was a lifetime decision. It wasn't, I'm going to do this because I want to, I'm, I'm going to, there's the goal. I'm going to get the goal and it's over. Mm -hmm. that, that's not, that's not what it was about. It was about, I'm going to be a musician from my entire life. And that's what I'm going to do. Whether I make money at it, well, I'm going to set my life up so that it doesn't matter. But I'm going to do what I love. It was about doing what I love and what I have passion for, not about making money. It's, it's about actually how many, the guy who wins is the guy who writes the most songs. It's not the guy who makes the most money. That's the way I look at it. And if you're a real artist, that's the way you should look at it. Yeah. So, so it, it was interesting though. So like in the movie and we'll get to the movie too, but like they show how, you know, obviously um, you know, the band is not a full-time thing at this point. It's you're kind of doing uh, shows on the side and stuff. So you're taking this job as a, as a truck driver and everything. I was just curious, like, why didn't you like do guitar lessons or singing lessons or manage bands? Oh, you did. Oh yeah. I was, I, I, I was, I, I, I was a guitar teacher for a number of years. Sure. I'm like I said, I set my life up so that I could do music and not depend on the band to make me money. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you, if you do that, then you can, you got longevity mm -hmm. and longevity is how you get to write all the songs. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and because I had, I never had to put, to have to depend on the band to make money. So when the money did come in for the band, it could revert it back into and reinvest it, not put it in my pocket or buy my groceries with it. Right, mm -hmm. reinvest it so that it can keep making records, so that it can keep the the cycle going, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. It's not a the, the animal movie is not about failure. It's actually about incredible success against massive adversity. Is what it's really about. Because how do you get? How do you put out twelve albums? Yeah, I mean, how you do, you do that. Yeah, you just kept going. It big. Yeah, it's so inspiring, and you're doing music on the weekends. But did you ever get discouraged or did you ever get depressed and just be like, because you are talented and Lemmy, you know, was a big fan. All these other, you know, Slash and uh, Metallica, these guys all loved you. And do you ever just get so frustrated that you're like, why the fuck are we not bigger? I, I mean, there must have been times like that where you just. Because, because there's not there's no justice. It's not about it's not about because the whole thing is not necessarily about your music at all it's about luck it's like what dave Grohl said to me at the fucking spirit awards he started telling me the story about him and kurt cobain living in a squatter house in los angeles after they fucking they used an old fucking beater to drive down there from from connecticut they drove all the way down to la they had nowhere to fucking stay they're living in a fucking squatter house in sleeping bags with no windows in the fucking in the apartment and 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 with no fucking money and then within fucking six months they're fucking wealthy and and living and staying at the, the hyatt regency and looking over fucking hollywood he goes you know what that's called that's called luck period wait how is you that in, you walk into a record label and you give them your tape and they go yes and uh -huh. then they put yeah. it out and it goes big that's but I, luck but i disagree with you because he kept going because so many people, if they're in the squatter house, I mean, your story is insane because it's like 40 years you kept going. So many people in your yeah, position. A, a part of, yes, yes, it's about perseverance. Mm -hmm. Perseverance, it's about, exactly. It's about seeing to the other side. And talent. You guys, you and, and David Grohl have and, talent. And fucking make, make it possible to, to get there. That's what it's all about. You can, but you got to want it. Right. Not enough. So when you have. But luck will come your way eventually, just like it does in the fucking casino i love your passion man this is inspiring i just listening to you. you should be a motivational speaker i love this this is like firing me up that's great well, I mean, look at <laughs> you stay in the music business you write enough songs you're going to get good at it whether even if you sucked at the beginning really okay? you think that yes so tell me about this you put, so you anybody you you put the time ten thousand hours man you're a professional I, am. I don't That's... give a fuck what you, you, you spend 10,000 hours at something, you're going to get good at it. Right. So, so, but tell me like when you have a bad gig during this time, like you said, the worst gig you did was a, a rehearsal room at a new year's Eve party. Literally like no one showed up. This guy bought thousands of dollars worth of booze. 
nobody shows up. What goes through your mind at that? You're just like, I, I mean, you don't get discouraged. You don't go, fuck. And you don't smash your guitar. You get angry. Do you just laugh it off? What is your, how do you handle those kinds of tough obstacles? It, it's, you, you can't blame yourself. Those are, those are circumstances that you, you got to look at things realistically. You can't blame yourself. When people don't show up to an Anvil show, it's not because the band is not good. It's because someone didn't do their job. Promoting. That's right. Okay. Well, so... And especially, especially at this point in the game. Yeah, for sure. You really fucking tell me. Really well, fucking tell the difference. Yeah. Because it doesn't make sense that one place is ram-packed and the next place is empty. Why no. is the place empty? And then when you you delve into the reasons, the guy didn't put up a fucking poster anywhere. Right. He didn't put an ad in any newspaper, didn't pay for any fucking anything on the radio. There, No one knew you're there. Right. Right. No, that's totally how true. How do you expect people to fucking know you're there? That's a huge... Know? That's a huge piece of it is the promotion because like we said, you have the talent. We've already dis well, discovered you know, that. The other thing is, especially with, with Anvil, with, with the, with the, with the, with the, uh, with the, the fame of the movie and everything, there should have been, there should be no problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Everything should act. Yeah. So let's talk about the and movie. What, and what, yeah. what happens is, and this is where the big, biggest mistakes happen. And I can, I can tell you right now, First of all, when a promoter, a promoter does what he usually does when he hires a metal band, he's got a handful of fucking people that he calls and, and sets up, sets up maybe interviews for, and they're all to do specifically and only with heavy metal. Fair enough. The problem is when you do that with Anvil is 90% of our audience aren't metal fans. So you're not letting them know. Gotcha. So you don't make, you don't, you don't fucking put an ad in, in the little fanzine. You go and pay the extra 50 bucks and you put it in the, in the, in the city's newspaper, because that's where, that's where all the fans are going to go. Hey, Anvil is playing that, the band that was in that movie. Yeah. Is playing. Let's go see it. Right. And then they got something, they can attach it. Exactly. But if you don't give that, if you don't put that ad where they can see it, they're not going to be there. Prime examples. I'm in fucking Chicago. Rob and I are standing on the side of a fucking street and there are virtually cars pulling over. This was just after the movie had come up. Cars are pulling over to get out to take pictures of Rob and I. And meanwhile, we're playing the city. At, at a gig that night and not one person knew we were playing. Oh yeah. That's bad marketing and promotion for sure. That's a huge piece of it. So, so what do you say? What, 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 do, you, what do you say about that? Am I going to go? It's all the band's fault. No, it's not no. the band's fault. That's a good to, point. Uh, all these, all these things have to do with who hired you mm -hmm. and what they're doing to, to, and, and th this is the other thing that, a lot of people, a lot of people don't realize when you sell your band to a promoter, if he pays fuck all, expect fuck all. Mm. Gotcha. Like, let's say you've got a promoter. He goes, I want Anvil. I've always wanted this band, but I can't afford it. And you, and, but I can afford money. He offers us money and it's way lower than the amount, but you want to get in that venue because you you've got a, an audience. Well, chances are, except the gig, you go there, no one shows up. Why? The guy didn't have the money. He didn't promote it. Yeah. No, that so makes sense. The less he pays, the more likely that he has no fucking money. <laughs> That's right. what it tells you. That makes sense. So the more that a promoter pays, then you can then you can pretty much count on he's going to do everything he can to recoup his money. Right. No, absolutely. You gotta think, you gotta think in this sort of way, and 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 so you, you, it's it's a business, and you got to look at it that way. And it's not you can't sit there and judge your 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 artistic value mm -hmm. 
on something that has nothing to do with artwork, mm -hmm. with well, your music. Yeah, and so part of the business... What I'm talking about has nothing to do with music. Right. No, it's about it has promotion. To do with, it has to do with, with, with promotion, yeah. with, with the business. Absolutely. But part of the promotion, now you say luck is uh, involved. So you guys did have some luck. I would call it also... Um, you know, partly that, you know, you were a good person. You planted these seeds early. You were friends with this guy who, or, or sorry, he was your roadie, Sasha. And he ends up being yeah. this big time screenwriter, writes the terminal movie with Tom Hanks. And he was a fan of the band. So then he decides to make this movie Anvil. And you're, I, I like your idea about it, how the worse that it gets in the movie, the better. And like that scene where you have, I rewatched this movie last night. It's so great. The scene where you have the blowout uh, with Rob. Uh, I mean, I feel like this is so healthy. I was a counselor for 17 years, so I know about like expressing emotions and all that. It's like almost healthy that you get the anger out because then you apologize. He gets mad at you. You guys work it out. Um, you know, I talked to the bass player from Tesla, Brian Wheat, and he said Tesla would have these physical fights and now they still have fights. They yell, but they call them discussions. Like, do you think it's necessary to have that kind of passion to make things great? Absolutely. 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 Any good relationship, no matter what it is, you're going to have arguments. And if you don't, and you probably don't have a good relationship and there's stuff that's being subdued and hidden. Because you guys pushed each because other to, no to do better. No two people can get along 100%, 100% of the time. No such thing. Right, right. And the things that, the, the things that Rob and I argue about, it's not about goal. It's about how to get there. Mm-hmm. Right. In no. other words, the end result, we both want the same thing. So arguing about how to get there is actually a good thing because you're going to learn from each other what what might be a, a better idea. Yeah. No, exactly. To get to the goal. You got to if as long as the goals at the end of, of the argument are the same, then and and the, and then you have a, then it's it's all good. Do you guys still have those kinds and, of? You know, it's it's interesting. It's not like it's not like I fight with Rob very often. It's, oh, you don't. It's okay. Actually, uh, it's every now and again, and I mean, like Sasha was following us around for fucking two and a half years, and when that fight happened, he goes, "I can't believe it! I've been fucking following you around for two fucking years, waiting for this to happen." Wow, that's because his whole thing was, "I got I got a show." A give a sense of reality and without an argument there's no sense of reality is there right you're not you're not showing the dynamics of the of the, the real relationship between the two people that you're supposed to be showing the, the showing a relationship of you're not showing all the you're not showing the most important facets mm -hmm. the way that you show the most the most important facets is show where the heads bang together and how and how they get over their differences. Nothing could be more descriptive of a rela relationship than a fight and getting over it. Yeah. So that's like that. Because, and, and, you know, like we're fucking scratching our hair. What are you saying, man? What? And it's, it's like when you don't have no idea how important that, and I hear when we're doing it, when we're going through it, well, and he gave us this sense of freedom, do whatever you want in the film. And if you don't like it, we'll just remove it. Hmm. So we didn't care if he filmed us beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> like, well, we'll just tell him to take it out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. of course, at the end of the day, it's in, it's the fight's in there, and I'm going, oh fuck. And then I came to realize, even though, even to this day, watching that makes me very uncomfortable, and actually reemerges all the all the emotion that was there. I still find it very difficult to watch because there's to a great extent, you don't understand. The audience will never understand what prompted that. Just the frustration. Really? It was the frustration no, of... No, no, no. There's... no. <laughs> In any case, it's not important. That's not what was important. And Sasha made me come to realize it's not important what the fight was really about. It's about the fight itself and getting over it is what the whole thing was about. It doesn't matter about the specifics. Specifics that you can keep to, to yourself and you never have to, the world never needs to know it. 
and he was right. And I'm not going to tell you all the little, they're stupid things. Well, yeah, because was have been going on since we're fucking 14 years old, man. <laughs> How do you start explaining that? And yeah. you know, you, you you can't. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's just. Well, and you apologize. So what I mean, you and you guys made up and you worked through it. So it's all good. Well, that's right. Yeah, and that's and the it, most important thing. Like Slush said, he he waited two years for that to happen. That's crazy. What if he had only followed you for an, a year and a half or something? Then you wouldn't have even caught that scene. Then the movie wouldn't be as good as it was. Right. right? Why did he follow you for so every, long? Every, That's a long every, time. Everything was important, man. It's and everything to a great degree was by luck and chance when it comes to do with that movie. You don't like you and 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 the biggest difference between the Anvil movie and everybody else's movie, everybody talks about their their careers in a retrospect. Mm -hmm. That's not how you go make a movie for to be entertaining for people today. No, that's Here true. Go, somebody's somebody's old fucking tour. Who the fuck cares? <laughs> I'd rather watch you. I'd rather watch you on tour right fucking now yeah. and know what's going to happen next. Right. Then know right. what I, I already know what happened. Exactly. No, because you're that's yeah. A, that's, a, that's, a, that's the that's the biggest difference. The Anvil movie lived in the now, not in the past. And the future, because then the movie comes out and it's a massive success. And then you guys get an opening slot with ACDC. So that's a big jump from doing, uh, you know, the shows that you see in the movie that are, you know, small crowds. So was there nervousness at that point or did you feel like, all right, this is where we're supposed to be? Um, no, I never felt like it's where we're supposed to be. You even didn't feel like you deserved I mean, it after I mean, all that I mean, I mean, perseverance. I'm being, I'm being completely honest. My my personal my personal fucking favorite things are playing to a packed club. Okay. I don't like big massive fucking arenas. Not fun. Really? You can't even you can't barely even hear the audience. You, you finish the song and it's like people even clapping. You can barely even hear it, man. And, and 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 the closest person is a hundred feet away from you. You almost feel like there's no one there at all. And you feel the same way about like the big festivals because you've done a lot of those as well. Yeah, big big festivals suck too because because when you've got let's say Wacken, let's say you've got sixty thousand people. Well, only twenty thousand of the people there are even into you. Hmm. Wow. So, and that, that goes for every fucking band, so except you, for the headliner, right. where most of the people are there to see the headliner. Yeah, if they make it that long, because those things are sometimes like yeah, all most day. People, most people don't even like the headliner, and they leave before it even happens. Yeah. So that, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other issue. But, I'm, but, but, my, but what I learned about, like, let's say the Wacken Festival, and we've done it in a, in a number of different ways. We've done the big stage and played in front of the 60 or 80,000 people. And it kind of sucks because you see pockets mm -hmm. of people in this big pool of fucking big, huge ocean of fucking denim. You see pockets of people freaking out and then huge areas where everybody's just standing there. Right. So you get that in the big, with the big stage, or they put you in on the, on the, on the smaller, smaller stages in the inside in the tents where you can get 20,000 people. Well, fuck. Put me in the fucking tent, man. The sides. Okay. Holy yeah. The tents. Fuck. That sounds 20, awesome. 20,000 fucking insane fucking anvil fans at once, all in one place packed together. That sounds fun. That's got, now that is fun. Okay. There we go. So the movie comes out and then um, so many people, so many famous people were a fan of it too. Like Robert Redford, Anthony Hopkins and Paul McCartney. Did you get to meet him? He said you enjoyed it. Yeah. Or he said that he enjoyed the movie and that you guys kick yeah. ass. Paul McCartney told you you kick ass. Uh, yeah. And th yeah. And I mean, it's, it's interesting because that's gotta be the ultimate validation. People, well, the thing is, this is what it is. People who are struggling to get someplace in the music business are jealous as shit. They fucking hate me. You know, and, and, and it's there. Some, some, 
wish me well and are, 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 are decent human beings, but a great proportion of, of, of musicians who are at least behind me or underneath or, or not as lucky are jealous as fuck. And you say that that's kind of a negativity is the projection of their own failure. Like you said, right? I mean, yeah. Or they're just heartless people. Of course. Of yeah. course. And th- th- I mean, that, that, that comes with it. And that actually is, is, a, is a direct indication of my success. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be jealous of if I wasn't successful. Right? I mm-hmm. mean, one and one is two, right? Right, yeah. You know, um, the, the, uh, it, it's, it's interesting, but it, 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 it doesn't do much for your, it, it doesn't do much for your feelings in the sense that why are people fucking down on me? I've worked so hard and so long why are you begrudge me that which you are chasing yourself? You should go good for you, man. You're lucky you fucking got through. Yeah. Not you fucking, why not me? Right. That attitude, why not, why you not me? Like, I've noticed that, that, that too in doing these interviews. A lot of the, the musicians that I looked up to as a kid, I interview them thinking they're going to be this cocky, arrogant rock star and they're all super nice and super down to earth and happy. And it's like, and that is a relation that, that is a a direct, that's a direct result of the, of they, they're grateful for where they fucking got. Yeah. That's why those that aren't are assholes. And you know that you're, you're, you're going to be pressed to find assholes that make it Mm -hmm. because usually assholes, fall away so did you still feel grateful and, and they're hard they're harder to work with and people right. won't put up with it and you're they're going to lose their record deal and they're, they're never going to be given their chance right so and that's like I said, yeah. when it, between luck and chance you still got to be a nice guy right that was a big piece of it because if you weren't nice to sasha he's not going to make a right. movie about you that's right yeah. exactly yeah well let's talk about um your new record legal at last the title track is so heavy but it's also really catchy and you've got the cool like uh background vocals i mean it really gets in your head but tell me what it, uh, it's 18th album so that's like a legal age and canadians recently legalized marijuana uh so tell me about uh the themes of this album i heard you talking about it. it's really interesting like you kind of go off the you kind of go down the rabbit hole i guess i should say it's kind of interesting yeah well it's uh, it is interesting because the topic of marijuana is is extraordinarily wide, wide ranged and meaningful on so many levels, and how in, its importance represents so much, so much that we not even realize until you actually start delving into the information. And when you do delve into the information, you start realizing how stupid humanity is, in 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 a certain sense. We, they made marijuana illegal, not because it gets you high. It's because it was a direct threat to the world economy. And then you're going, well, how the fuck does that work? Well, the production of hemp and the manufacturing of hemp can replace all of our pulp and paper. So there's our forestry industry. Mm-hmm. Fucked. Paper industry. Fucked. Cotton industry. Fucked. You can even make fucking biofuel, diesel from it. Now you fucked the oil companies. So how much more? How much more of the of manufacturing and of the manufacturing world would that upset? Right. You can replace all plastic with hemp. Hemp produced biodegradable plastic and the cbd oil isn't that a big thing you said that and, you- and now <clears throat> now and then the biggest the biggest fucking ir- irony of it all is we with all the chemicals that we poison ourselves with our fucking plastic wrapped food that seeps into our food and eventually gives us all cancer we're finding that marijuana is something that might be helping in the curing of cancer no, I, I agree. I think it. So, but... so you start thinking about all these things now. What are we? What is? What does all this mean? Well, first of all, in the production of cotton, we've virtually all the topsoil is destroyed on all the farmland. So you got to put, put, got to put uh, um, 
nutrients back in. So now you've got to make nutrients, right? So now you have runoff. The, the runoff to the, the, through the ground and from the rain, but from all the chemicals that you're using to produce cotton is poisoning the fucking ground, okay? Uh, you've got to put insect repellent on everything. Otherwise, they're going to get, they're going to get fucking, it, all the crops are going to get, get chewed up. So all this, all this negative aspect to make cotton, right? Which is one of the biggest industries in the fucking world. All of our fucking clothes. Right. Yeah, for okay. sure. So it could have been made out of hemp, which is completely fucking self, like a self-manufacturing fucking product. And they made it illegal because it was going to put the cotton industry out of business. So these are these are these are this is at, at, at the heart of it. But 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 also look at what we've done to our world. We've polluted it. Look at all the plastic in the ocean that could have been made from biodegradable fucking plastic made from hemp. That would it wouldn't be. All this shit wouldn't be. All is a result of marijuana. So legal at last, damn right. It should have been legal all along. So hopefully we can solve these problems now, right? Uh, no, we're still a long way off. <laughs> we're still far. We're still, we're still so far off because even though they've in places where they have made marijuana illegal, they haven't stopped going cotton. Yeah, yeah. So the we song... haven't replaced the cotton factories right. with hemp factories. Yeah. Well, we hopefully we'll get there, or at least have some more. We haven't replaced our, our our oil industry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, pulp and paper. Fuck, man, we could have been making hemp paper. We don't have to cut down our trees. Why are we cutting trees down? I'd rather do the hemp. The hemp thing. I like your idea. It sounds great if it, if it works. What about so? But the song "Nabbed in Nebraska" is that I hear like you know, police smoking weed ain't no crime. Is this an autobiographical song, or is this just a hypothetical, or something else? Some this happened to someone else? No, no, we got, I got, we got, we got, we got, I got busted. We got busted. Oh, you did. We drive in, yeah, we were driving. We drove in from from Oregon into into Nebraska. We drove across the border, and then there's a fucking sign that says says drug dogs on duty, and it's like, well, Oops. fuck. Okay, so we start driving off an off ramp, and I've got pot. I want to put pot down my pants, right? <laughs> so it's in my it's in my my pouch, right? My 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 fanny pack. So I pull it out of my fanny pack, put it on the on the on the on top of the fucking dashboard so that I can take the fanny pack off, undo my belt, and stuff the fucking pot down my pot pants. Right? Yeah. So we're going up the ramp and it's fucking boiling hot. And I fucking touch the window to bring it down a bit, but it has an automatic and the whole thing goes right down. The weed flew out the window. <laughs> God. The weed was in a, the tiny little plastic. It was like a gram. Okay. My friend had given it, and I would quit. I quit. I quit smoking. I wasn't smoking anything. And the guy begged me, "Take this because you you might want to get high." And it's like, dude, I, I I I can't get high without tobacco, and I'm quitting tobacco. So I don't want to smoke it. So just take it. So I had taken it anyway. I, a tiny little thing. Anyway, I had wrapped it in Kleenex, and the Kleenex wrapped in with the plastic is on the dash and it flew out the window anyway not to my knowledge or i didn't realize it but uh when you go up the ramp there's a policeman sitting in a parking lot beside the ramp okay and he's watched the shit go out the window oh so of course he immediately pulls out of the ramp and chases us because we we just wanted to turn around and go back the other way. Right? So he follows us and pulls us over, and he comes up to my side of the the uh, van, and he goes, he goes to me, uh, "What'd you throw out?" And I go, "I didn't throw anything out." He goes, "Well, we're going to find out in a second what you threw out." Oh, and shit. then the other cop comes walking up. Look what I found. And he comes up with weed, and I go, "Oh fuck." Well, he goes, I'll give you two choices, buddy. Either admit that you threw this out the window, or I'm charging with obstruction of, of justice. Oh. And trying to get trying, trying to, 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 
to avoid getting getting arrested, right? Admit it, it's yours and, and it's all good, or you're gonna be doing court and fucking maybe time, right? Shit. So I went, okay, yeah, well, and then I started explaining to the guy it flew out. I didn't do it on purpose, and it's going, well, regardless. Here in Nebraska, it's a misdemeanor. Don't worry about it. You've got no fucking, you've got no fucking police record, but now you owe me for littering and for possession of marijuana. Three hundred dollar fine. Ah, that's not so bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cooler story, though. It could have been. It could have been worse. Yeah, it could have been a lot worse. It yeah. could have been way worse. And uh, it was interesting because what they do is they give you a. They give you a phone number to call, and because I'm not from, I was not from the states. Sure, I had to call the magistrate or the head of the or the judge himself, and they would just tell me how much I owe them. Okay, that's not so bad. And and that's basically what happened. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise you have to come and try and fight it or get yeah, a lawyer. Yeah. Right. So the album is, uh, you said that it's kind of like a lot of f- facets of metal. You mentioned uh, one of the, a flavor of Ted Nugent. And I, I think the song, I'm Alive, am I crazy? Yeah. To, that sounds a little bit like Cat Scratch Fever. Well, it's the, it's the chord, the chord, it's the same chords, but not in the same order. Okay. Are you, so you're obviously a Ted Nugent fan, right? Of his music? Oh, yeah, a long time, long time. Obviously. Okay, but... Yeah. I'm guessing, I'm just taking a wild guess here. You guys might disagree politically. Would you, would you ever have like a friendly debate with him, like political debate or discussion or have you? Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. He might have, he's definitely got different views, especially when it comes to marijuana. I mean, we'd probably be at each other's throat for that. But a lot of his, a lot of what he says is, like he says, is truth, logic, and common sense. Really? Okay, I'm surprised I mean, to hear that. Get angry at, you can get angry at me. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, but interesting. So when, when, you, when you tell people the truth, they usually get pissed off, and that's what a lot of people get when they hear Ted talk. That's interesting. Yeah, right? just just so based on your stance on marijuana and the environment and all this, I, I would I would thought I thought you would totally disagree with everything he says, but you're saying oh, no, some no, things. No, no, no. I'm an environmentalist, and so is he. We actually have a lot of places where we actually are in complete. Com- Complete fucking sink. There's no question about it. Hmm. There's a lot of things that I I completely agree with them, but no no question about it. Certainly, if I came, if I was born in Detroit and was raised there, I believe that owning a gun is a ne- as a necessity. The and gun- a god given and a god given right. Well, gun- guns are legal in Canada, right? Still, or are they change no, it? No, virtually not. Virtually. Oh, did but, they change that? But what, why are you going to own a gun in Canada? Yeah, everybody's so nice there. I don't think there, there's no. Like... I mean, generally, if you're going to own a gun in Canada, it's because you're a criminal. Or what about? Isn't there a lot of good hunting in? I'm not a hunter, but I, I assume there's a lot of yes, good hunting there. there. Is, there. Course, no, no, there's no question about it. But they don't. They don't buy handguns. Oh, okay, handguns. So they could still buy rifles and things. Oh yeah, and yeah. And, 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 and it is sportsmanship, and that's fine. I don't have a fucking problem with. It. I got a problem with billions and billions of dollars worth of fucking smuggled guns from from the states that are arming all of our all of our fucking all of our criminals. That's what I've got a fucking problem with. Yeah, that's a tough one. And and that, and, that, and that is a problem. What do you do and, about and it? And it, it's like and 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 I agree with Ted. Making guns illegal only puts only puts guns in the hands of criminals you're taking all the guns away from the the, the law-abiding citizens right and you're arming the citizens yeah it's illegal to kill people how does, how does that make sense yeah. you can and you know what unarmed and helpless is unarmed and helpless That's, yeah what can i say it's there's, hard. there's a lot of things he, there's a lot of things that he says that make sense the other thing is statistically he talks about statistics he never says anything without the backing of real hard fact statistics gun free zones have the highest fucking murder rates because you can't magically get rid of all the guns yeah. you can argue from now he, they, watch 
Pierce, watch him on Pierce Morgan. I saw Pierce that. Pierce Morgan yeah. tried to argue everything. They, Ted walked all over him. That was a, that was a good undo, clip. They can't undo America's history and constitution. They're trying really hard, but they're not going to undo it. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. Well, I, so I mean, I'm not even American, but I know <laughs> they're not going to fucking take. They're not taking. They're not taking foundational fucking constitutional rights out. It's you almost, gonna, you almost seem like an American. Happen. You're, you're like not polite enough to be Canadian. I feel like Canadians are usually more subdued. You're like so. You're like an American. I well, like maybe it. Maybe that's maybe maybe that's what's given me my luck. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Maybe why, I'm, maybe why I've got somewhat of a following in America. Oh, for sure. Can, I, uh, there's something that, that that's more relatable to. Oh, it's to definitely. Yeah, your personality I, 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 is part I, of the I'm band. Not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start waving the flag. I take guns away from everybody. Fuck that. <laughs> there's a reason for everything, man. Yeah. And and the foundational, the whole foundational aspect of of America. If it wasn't for the gun, the, it's the the whole fucking the whole being of America is is, is written in, into its history due to the gun. How would you have a fucking won the land? Good point. You didn't you didn't beat beat the the the, the First Nation people with a with bow and arrows. If you won <laughs> you won the land because you had guns. <laughs> the muskets, yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, no, that's true. It's a crazy history. You know, but... and, the, and the other thing is, you didn't win the second. We didn't win the Second World War with a with a with a fucking with a pie in the face. We, <laughs> they invented the atomic fucking bomb. Yeah, the ultimate gun. Right, right? weapons for sure. Right. So, so what, what? What is the philosophy? What is human philosophy? What is? What are we all? What are we? We're a fucking. We're a fucking fucked up. A fucked up animal and we're at the top of our t our food chain and the only way that we can we can keep the numbers down is killing each other you know i'm i just as, God, a, I just, as a, just as an observation you've got you, everybody wants to blame their your your president whether it's obama whether it's trump whether it's biden you guys separated the people no wrong <laughs> you're separate to begin with you're all separated Everybody's out for themselves. That's the fucking problem. It's not just the good guys, the bad guys. It's everybody's a good guy and everybody's a bad guy. Now this is what this is. So okay, this no, is. No, yeah. I'm going to go on. What I'm what I'm saying is, you need focal points. Yeah. You need focal points. This is what I. My, the problem is yeah. right now and during the whole Trump administration, <sighs> there was no focal point, no war. That's oh, now, so you, I, we got a my war. Neighbor, my neighbor ain't looking so good to me. Yeah. Well, so now this. I need. I need to focus. So now I hate Democrats or I hate Republicans. Because but we're now. Now, now you got the Democrats back in back in power, and they start up another war with the fuck with 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 Iran. Syria. Great. Now you got now you got your now you got your your focus back. You're gonna now you're gonna have. A bunch of other people to hate outside your country and everything's going to be fine in in the house <laughs> i just hope we don't start a war with canada that would be that would be a, a rough one yeah no it's just it's just kind of an observation but it's but it's 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 really it's not it's not just it's not just uh it's not just one country it's it's humanity it's humanity that's what we really are. We're really barbarians. We're cavemen with computers, basically. That's we're an interesting still, observation. We've got yeah. all this great technology, but our, our brains are still are still living in the caves. We're still competing for power, money, things that are that, that are that are are tangible only. Right. You know, it's not it's not like we're trying to do, uh, trying to, to to do things to make things good. We're actually trying to do things to make things good for me. Well, I hope and some people all try about to me myself. Yeah. And I. I hope some people try to do some good things for the the world. You guys, are you guys going to do a tour? Are are those tour dates on your website legit? Are they, are you going to tour the world and bring Anvil music? Yeah, they're supposed to be. Supposed to be. Supposed to be. Okay, and and they're not making a sequel. Oh, we'll see what happens. 
Yeah. And so they're not making a sequel to the Anvil movie. I know that there's been talk of that, but now you're saying no, no way. What would you guys just do like a home uh, video f- of footage? Because I know when I was a kid, I used to watch like a year and a half in the life of Metallica and those kinds of things that were just kind of like home videos that they collected and put in a DVD. I haven't thought much about doing that. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's been too busy. After after the movie, we haven't. It's been nonstop. Sure. I mean, this has been the longest. This has been in the longest period of time since before the movie that I've been off. Hmm. Very, 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 very weird. Yeah. Um, we I went 13, 13 years in a row with no time off. Like literally no time off. You know, you finish a tour, you start writing, you're in the rehearsal yeah. room writing, and then you got to go on the tour again. You come back and you write, go back on the tour, and then you go record an album. And then after you finish the album, you can start touring again. And then it, it's been nonstop for fucking 13 years up until right now. So it's it's actually quite quite a remarkable quite remarkable and it's um, really really concerning because you know especially when you're turning sixty five you're going wow how many more years have I got really yeah and I want to be on stage and I'm capable of being on stage I should be doing it while I can right I hope it yeah and, and, and that, that's really really bothering me it's 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 a lot to fucking deal with but i keep myself extremely busy like i said i went and written another album since i got back from the uk last yeah year. So, so when will that next I'm, album come out are you going to save that till 2022 or yeah that's going to be out in 2022 uh, around this time of year okay perfect so hopefully we'll look for that hopefully we'll look for shows so in a, in would you words in another another two years really two years not not next i guess it would be i guess next march okay will be coming out so yeah um would you uh tour the we're states gonna try to get and we're gonna try to get it recorded in september of, of this year we'll see hopefully. okay yeah and then would you, are you guys gonna do any shows in the states at some point eventually okay well if eventually. you could right hopefully now we're, right now the borders are closed. We're not coming down anytime yeah. soon. Okay. Um, the other thing is, um, there are there are other backlog things to even get through the border. Mm. There could be issues even getting us work visas. Oh. Because they're going to be backlogged. Okay, if that's a good point. Fucking tours, right? Yeah. Backlog. His brother's going to be one, right? Yeah, that's a good so point. I didn't we'll think about see that. how that. I don't know how that's going to work. Well, hopefully you can get down and catch a show if you're. I, I, we don't really. We're not. We're, we're not too particularly fond of the idea of playing shows and there's 20 people there, and they're and we're playing behind plexiglass. That doesn't <laughs> sound like much fun. No, 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 no. We get. Well, I think once they get all the vaccinations, I feel like hopefully things will kind of go back to normal. That's my hope, anyways. It's you know the the biggest the biggest problem is the fear. It's a big piece of it, yeah. It really, it really, people are scared. Been, yeah, people are just fucking scared. Yeah. And the more the more scared they are, the more they're making up making up shit to be scared of. The, the misinformation out there is unbelievable. Right. No, the it's the vaccine got fucking tracking devices in it <laughs> for what purpose? <laughs> like, what the fuck is that about? Like, where are people getting that from? What and why? Yeah. So well, it's got metal in it, so they can trace you. Well, let me tell you something. Our bloodstream is based on iron. We've already got metal in our fucking blood. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Is this why, why do they need? Why are they tracking? Go yeah. ahead. Is this why you uh, you don't go on social media? Give me a tracking device. Go ahead. <laughs> Follow me. Where am I? you're breaking up so a little. fucking stupid man yeah is you know, and, th- and this is why you you don't go on social media because you don't want to hear about all this right yeah i'm off facebook i fucking had enough does rob run no, who I, runs I, your I've facebook page for the anvil no, I, goodbye rob 
Oh, Rob, Rob does. does. Okay. Cool. Well, um, I, I do like to end each episode with a charity. Is there a charity that you work with or you want to get a get kind of a shout out to here at the end? Not really. Um, <laughs> charities? Jeez. I get, you know, there's always the same charity starts at home. But <laughs> I think I think anything that gives me uh, help children okay that's where it should go okay sounds good yeah i know i have a lot of those I, I most most believe okay sounds good i'll put that in the notes i'll put all the anvil's uh, website on there and people should check it for tour dates and all the records your catalog the spotify you got a lot of great music and, and people should see the movie if they haven't seen it it's so great i've watched it twice now it's amazing <laughs> read the book it's even better oh i haven't read the book yet i'll have to check that out well thanks so much for doing this you can find the book on amazon yeah it's, it's out there i'll check that out oh thanks so much for doing this and uh hope to see a show from you i've never seen you guys live so hopefully if you come to phoenix or nearby i'll come and uh check you out that'd be fun okay sounds good man uh, let's let's just hope that this fucking bullshit pandemic ends sooner than later That's yeah all. me too i hope so all right thanks so much lips i'll see you later Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Wow. So that was Lips of Anvil. Definitely not boring. He's very passionate about his music and the band Anvil and his stances on weed and many other things. And again, if you disagree with him, that's okay. Uh, But don't assume that I am agreeing with everything he says either. I definitely uh, appreciate his openness and honesty about all his opinions, though. And whether you agree or not, it's always interesting to hear what people think about things. I found it really interesting that he thinks a big part of success is luck. Because I personally think it's a very small part. I think he had talent. I think he made good relationships with people. And I think he worked hard and had perseverance. And I think that was what attributed for a lot of his success. But anyways, check out the Anvil website for tour dates and merchandise and all that good stuff. Uh, You can follow them on Facebook to keep up with them. And while you're on there, you can follow my podcast page. Or if you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel or Spotify, wherever you listen. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode... Uh, You can share it on your social media, or if you hated it, you can tell me to fuck off on social media. So thank you for listening to the show. I hope you have a great day. And remember, shoot for the moon.